Okay, so welcome everyone. Welcome to another session of the Portuguese uh, Beyond Borders Institute's uh, Symposium, Filaments of the Atlantic Heritage. Uh, we are happy to have you uh, on board for this special session. Uh, we have lots of different uh, sessions, but this one here, of course, because of the day that we are commemorating, which is uh, World Poetry Day, is uh, really is significant. And um, we want to welcome each and every one of you. We want to thank the six poets and our literary critic, Humberto Freitas, for taking time to be uh, uh, present on this event. We want to thank all of you who are uh, attendees here uh, on Zoom and all of you who are following us right now on social uh, media uh, through uh, Facebook uh, Live. So uh, we have Jose Raposo, by the way, on there, but Jose, you have your camera turned off. So you have to turn your camera on so we can see you. And the rest of us, we can see everybody's smiling faces. It is uh, a mid, a wonderful uh, springtime uh, day here in California, about the, the best time uh, for the valley, right, Sam? <laughs> it's the springtime until it gets, yeah, until it gets really hot. Uh, and hopefully the weather's good in New York, Scott. Very good. Beautiful uh, day. 60 degrees. Oh, sunny. Wow. wow. And Massachusetts, Logan, how's, uh, how's, how are things there? About the same as New York. Can't complain. Very oh, sunny. Oh, good. <laughs> and, <laughs> and in British Columbia. Muita chuva. Muita chuva. Oh. <laughs> Mas chove sempre. It's always rain, so it's nothing new. <laughs> I think they just start, say that so that we will, all, won't all move there because it's so beautiful there. But <laughs> yes. Oh, it's raining all the time. Ok, okay José. Oh, Agora já estás. Mas, mas, ainda, mas estás em silêncio. Retira-me essa, essa coisa daqui. Ok, yeah, unmute yourself, José. You're on mute. We will not be able to hear you. Okay, so thank you all for joining us. We will be um, uh, reading some poetry. The, we want to thank all of these poets uh, for agreeing to be here in a very informal setting as uh, poetry readings should be. And um, we're going to, uh, we're going to, there's no particular order, but I just looked at the list here. And uh, since uh, Lada has probably the best background in the world uh, mm. the, uh, of the beautiful island of Flores, we're going to start with Lada. And what says Neem, as uh, for those of you following us, we'll have each one of the poets read uh, one of their works. They can tell us a little bit about how the poem came about. And uh, it's always an interesting take for those uh, of us uh, watching and following. And then uh, we'll go around every single person and Scott is going to read from his new book. Um, and um, it will, it's a longer uh, poem. So he will read it all in one. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to break it. And so uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, he'll, he'll be the last of the first session and the, fir and the first of the second session. And then at the end, uh, we'd like to have some conversation about the Azores, about your poetry, about literature, about um, poetry in general, and, uh, and these Azorean connections, okay? And of course, we'll hear from Vamberto as well. So uh, Lada, would you please start? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um... I'm going to start, well, Elaine actually gave me a couple of poems that were her favorites that I could read. And, and actually I'm going to, I have two of those poems, Elaine. Uh, and it fits right into Into the Azorean Sea and Flores Island. As you see in the background, uh, this is the island where my grandfather came from. However, my mother's side came from Pico and my father's side came from Fayal as well. So I, I even think sometimes I might have a cousin in Elaine, but we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this, this poem is about my grandfather's immigration, uh, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a story and there's some fantasy in it and it's not a true story. Actually, this grandfather um, had a stepfather in uh, Fajazinha, where I think he was from, and the stepfather was mean to him, so he, he uh, uh, came over to, when he was a teenager, he, he jumped a ship and he, he got over uh, to um, New Bedford and from there came to California and met my grandmother during the gold rush. So there you go. Flores Island, the place at the beginning. Remember, this is fantastical as well as halfway true. The place at the beginning a wail rises up in her mind, turning her thoughts gray. In port, the ferry of return, she searches for her grandfather, 
to discover the shape of his immigration and finds the planks gone, rotted. At the mercy of rough water and high winds, he rode sinews, pulling his dory, pulling his bones to breaking. She scans the distance, says his name out loud, Antonio Enriquez, waits to hear a voice, see a face. She searches for all the prisoners of thick mists, others who look like her, whose foreign tongues speak music to her soul. Beyond the wake of a rogue wave, currents and tides ride on the back of a gray whale. She sees through the vapor boats whose nets gather the sky and let go. Fog falls, bearing dazed souls back to their home place. She falls with them. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Lada. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful poem. Uh, uh, Sam, Sam Pereira. Okay. Um, I've um, put this first poem in uh, the new book that just came out called True North and Untrue You. And many of my poems are not, don't have a connection to uh, my Portuguese ancestry, but this one does. It's called Amanya. And I've mentioned before that I, I think as, you know, as Portuguese words go uh, for a non-speaker like me, it's one of those words I, I glommed onto really early and I find it absolutely beautiful. And I still do. Um, in the case of this poem, I end up naming an imaginary daughter, Amanya. Years ago, while staring at a plate of sardines in what passed for a winter sun, the old thoughts returned. How on numerous occasions, under the direction of a bass guitar, my head filled with a darkness even Melville might have envied. I had walked the perimeters of this small town most of my life, sometimes knowing that cars might come out of nowhere, sounding horns, the split second before ending my lusts for a scotch in the night. I thought about the anguish some saw in being alone. I picked one particular evening, face dashed with the blood of my follies, and sat, just sat on a curb, dreaming about making love with the sea. Her salt and inf infinitely wet glances bouncing off my forehead and off into the after breeze we'd shared there. If I had been lucky, if I'd seen the clouds as the ocean's gray mascara designed to wear me down and take me, I might have been okay with that. I might have said in a slumber of love that she, my beloved Pacific, had given me a daughter, Amanya, wearing the haunting silver of sardines. Fantastic. One of my favorite poems from a new book. I guess there's a, quite a few favorites, uh, but that's one of them. Uh, Elaine. Uh, this one is called Grandmother's Embroidery. Oh. <laughs> Grandmother's Embroidery. In full bloom, grandmother's blue hydrangea tumbles through space, shining alone, overturned, while grandpa's boat beckons with sails of gold dancing on a white blue sea. She's done it, broken the patterns, made something original, 
found American threads so brilliant she can capture Azorian light. In the Azores, we call it luz insular, a light so particular it floats, promising miracles, as if only somewhere else will relieve a thousand deprivations. Luz insular should tell the truth, like grandmother's embroidery. If you leave, you may discover yourself tumbling, overturned, out of proportion, alone, yet able, stitch by stitch, to make a Azorian light dance. Very well. I love the imagery. Oh, my. Well done. Well done, Elaine. Um, and uh, next, we're going to turn to uh, José Raposo. <clears throat> okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, it's good afternoon here. <laughs> And thank you, uh, Denise, for inviting me. And if I am allowed, I would like to send a special um abraço muito grande para o Bomber. Obrigado. Todas as vezes que veio São Miguel, nós encontramos. I had no idea that I could write poems in English, although I learned English and French back home. And until I started to translate a poem that I wrote from Portuguese to English. But I said, wait a minute, why am I translating this? Why don't I write in English? <laughs> <laughs> and here is one. Uh, what made me write uh, this poem that I'm going to recite and to which I give the name of longing? Um, it's a feeling that every immigrant has. We left our homeland, but we still want in our yards the kale, the fava beans, the hydrangeas, and even the canaries. Yes, years ago, I brought from the Azores legally 10 wild canaries. <laughs> when we look at our yards, so that takes us back home without leaving the place where we, were, we are. The happiness of being called Portuguese in America neutralizes the sadness of being called American in my homeland when I go back. Here is the poem. <laughs> Yanked by a desire for better living and riding the wings of destiny, I left. I will never forget the trilling of the wild canary or the whistle of the blackbird, the variegated color of the adranches dividing the green fields or the multicolored azaleas in the parks and gardens, the gentle waves kissing the black sandy beaches or the fury of the surf pounding on the volcanic shores of the island. Thousands of miles away, wearing out the leather soles of my adulthood, I long for the basaltic cobblestones of my youth, where so many times I left the skin of my feet. Mm. Very nice. Very well. Mm. And uh, Logan. Nice. Righty. Uh, so this first poem that uh, I'm bringing to you today is a, is a version of that was originally published uh, uh, by the Tribuna Portuguesa with, in collaboration with the PBBI, um, one of the initiatives of PBBI. And uh, naturally, uh, you know, since its original publication, I, I've revisited it many times and it's evolved and gone through this process of metamorphosis that I, at least for me, is one of the most joyful parts of, of being a writer. You get to see the poem. Uh, see the poems that we write evolve and grow almost like they were like they were our own children. Uh, the poem in its current state does still maintain the the original title, which is my statue. <laughs> um, and I, I should mention that the the newest version of the poem is forthcoming in the upcoming number of Gavia Brown. So I'm very excited for that. Um, this poem is is an act of homage to an Azorian man who is the lifeblood of my Portugueseness and my Asurianidad. He is the, the reason that I ever picked up my first Portuguese textbook. And he is the reason that I am here today. Uh, this particular poem was actually birthed out of a mix of memories from my time that I spent living in Lisbon. Uh, oftentimes on a rainy day, I would, I would sit outside my apartment building or I'd go for a stroll through what <laughs> seems like thousands of praças that exist in Lisbon and, and just people watch and be and, and exist. Uh, so the poem takes us through uh, a simultaneous scene really uh, of one of those rainy day strolls um, that mixes the reality of what I was seeing with the memories 
in the thoughts that I was simultaneously reflecting upon and experiencing in my mind. So without further ado, the title is My Statue. Oh. Rain pelts the cobblestone calzada. A utopia turns to a war zone. Tourists scatter. I walk, knowing all too well the dangerous potential of a slick calzada. Some of them slip. Now they know. Walking, thinking, unperturbed by the hail of crossfire in which I'm caught, I lift my head to see a statue. I stop, my eyes examining its unique character. It stands firm, the quintessence of gallantry, completely untouched by the bombardment letting loose on the city. All else assumes a deep gray despondence, battered by the bombs that fall from the clouds. The streets are barren, a wasteland, but the statue stands unscathed. Only light shines on this singular obra prima, perfectly guarded in a safe corner of the universe. A man stands chiseled out of the finest marble. His eyes look directly at me, no one else. Below him, a plaque. Ocean crosser, storm braver, fearless warrior. Who could it be? A hero to the people? A national figure? The sacred one-eyed man? No, this is no ordinary statue. This one is only mine. I continue walking, still thinking. I still see a statue, my statue, my avo. The corners of my mouth raise nearly to my ears at the sight of my statue and the rain clears. Tourists emerge from their hideaways, some still rubbing their bruises, their selfies one shade darker now. But my statue remains unscathed. It guides me through the war zone, a beacon amidst broom, so that when others run and sometimes slip, I walk and think of my statue when life sacrificed so much so that I may not fear the rain and that I may turn my war zone into utopia. Hmm. Right. Very well, very well, very well. Thank you, Logan. Uh, amazing. And uh, we're going to turn to Scott. And uh, Scott will tell us a little bit about um, what he's going to read, which poem he's going to read uh, from his uh, magnificent new book. Yes, thank you, Denise, and thank you for inviting me. This is a wonderful honor to be uh, amongst all of you and reading poetry on World Poetry Day. It's also, um, ironically, International Forest Day. So when you think about the book of poems that you have in your hands, think about the forest that it came from. Um, I thought I would read, with that in mind, um, uh, a s section two of Azorian Suite, which is why I'm getting sandwiched in the middle here, because it's, it's really... Um, longer than, than, a, than, than a, a, a poem, a single poem. Um, the, uh, this book is, um, was a love letter to the Azores, uh, which um, uh, is, is uh, and some of the explanation of my, my Azorian background is, uh, is in this section of, of the poem that I'll, that I'll read. Um, and it, it's uh, divided into four sections as, as a suite should be. And, um, each section is uh, distinct um, in thematically, but it's also connected to, to the others. And I'm exploring my connections to the island, specifically of, of Sao Miguel, but, but also Azorianness um, overall. Um, but also going a little bit further, um, given my background in, in environmental work, thinking about climate change impacts on the island and thinking about um, how the island was popul became populated both by species, uh, you know, the wonderful hydrangeas that we love came from somewhere else and, um, uh, but have become identified with the island. So it sort of talks about um, what it means to be a Zorian as well. So this is uh, section two of a Zorian suite. Standing before Ponta Delgada's city gates I wonder how my great grandparents felt when they passed through one last time to board separate emigrant ships, the Peninsular and the Romanic, one month apart in 1906. It was early spring and they would never see their island home again. My main approaches to the island 
have been by air over the ocean from New York. First sighting Santa Maria and then Sao Miguel or by small tourist boats, whale watching off the Southern coast or touring the North. My great grandmother, Anna Rarich Kashiu was 14 years old when she left along with her parents and siblings. My great grandfather, Jose Rodriguez Kishkiu, was 19 years old and left his entire family in Fajdasima for America. The dock is the only hope of men with no goodbye. Longitude and isolation, the slow moving seafloor spreading along the mid Atlantic Ridge, which runs from Iceland to Tristan da Cunha. The Azores, where three continental plates come together and drift away, causing constant tectonic disturbance. These volcanic islands share no land with continents or each other. Only the wind and sea brought life to the islands, flora and fauna, and its people, all immigrants from elsewhere. Only those organisms resilient enough to cross the ocean could call the islands home. Only those resilient enough to survive could take hold, make a life here, prosper. Only the strong survive and thrive. Steep-sided volcanic islands surrounded by sea and very little shelf, causing cold upswelling currents deep from the ocean floor that meet warm waters from the Gulf Stream making for nutrient sea rich seas perfect for feeding sperm whales and other marine life. While far above the surface, the Azores High, a high pressure system lingering over the islands meets the same Gulf Stream waters, bestowing upon the islands their subtropical climate. How long will it last if the stream slows or stalls as some scientists predict in this century? And what will it mean for the islands and their people? No one has yet determined the true impact of sea level rise on the islands. Although scientists speculate, Graziosa will be underwater while Santa Maria keeps rising. But consensus is clear. More future coastal protection measures will be needed and possibly some relocation of coastal communities. Sahok. Villa Franco de Campo and Ribeira Grande, among them in Sao Miguel. Winters and summers will be wetter with increasing ascent of moist air over the island's terrain and a small increase in temperature in the region. Although the islands are shielded from more drastic temperature increases, such as the ones projected for mainland Portugal, Basically, we're looking at more summer days and more tropical nights. Still, wherever I go on the islands, I open my After Ice app and see what's projected if all the Earth's ice melts. Will this place or that be underwater, even if beyond my life expectancy? In early October 2019, Hurricane Lorenzo became the easternmost Category 5 hurricane on record skirting the Western Azores and producing the strongest winds for a tropical cyclone there in 20 years. Flourish and Corvu endured the worst of the winds with a maximum gust of 163 kilometers per hour, 101 miles per hour on Corvu before Lorenzo raced towards Ireland and the UK. 15 meter waves hit the islands, leaving 53 people homeless and damaging the docks at Port of Lages de Florges. It is, is this the fate of the island's future? Stronger storms reaching further north and east than ever with the islands in their path, increasing risks of floods, landslides, coastal damage, displacement and destruction. Thank you. If I could Thank make you. a comment, it's a very good omen, but besides that, a geography lesson. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, Scott, I guess I have to move from yeah. South Park. Back. <laughs> you may have to move to from South Park. <laughs> yeah, I could you... see myself in my. I am right on. Uh, though I could see myself in the Escola Industrial in Ponta Delgada. Mm. Your Tenant Coronel Nossanita was my ge geography teacher. Mm. So I was seeing myself on the map, you know. <laughs> <pretty different. laughs> right. There are, um, uh, for certain rivalries in the Azores, there's some that they would rather, some places that they would like to see underwater. Oh, <laughs> the, the typical oh, oh, oh. <laughs> island rivalry, right from there to between a couple of the islands. <laughs> but anyway, we'll, we'll come back to uh, uh to, to well, it's, a, Florida, it's a wonderful Florida and Corvo are on the American plate. Uh, so right, that's right. They'll move closer to America. They'll be in Boston. <laughs> <They'll> be in <laughs> well, uh, indeed. And so we're going to go back around, but a little bit different now. And uh, but now that as I mentioned, Flores and Corvo, you know, there's this wonderful um, tale of um, a couple of things in, about Flores, and of course, as you know, Monchique, that uh, uh, that uh, rock there, that islet there, uh, is the most western point of all of the, of the European continent, and not uh, in mainland Portugal, as some people have said. And so, um, uh, the other day we had one of our uh, events uh, for PBBI and Professor Carlos Amaral from the University of the Azores was talking about um, the Azorean connection with the, with Americas. And he was talking when he went to the Azores and uh, he went to uh, the Azores to, to Flores um, uh, when he was uh, doing some research in his first year's teaching. And uh, a gentleman took him around the island and uh, pointed to uh, Monchik and said, uh, um, that's where America begins. Uh, that's where America begins. You know, America's right there. And there's this wonderful thought that, of course, that's, uh, you know, that um, Peter de Silveira used to talk uh, in some of the uh, evenings that Humberto uh, and I, Humberto spent a lot more time with him than I did, but I, a few of them that I was, uh, was uh, privileged to spend with him, he would say that folks, when uh, in early times in uh, 20th century, End of the end of the uh, 19th, beginning of the 20th century, when some of the ships would go in that direction, either whether they're go going or coming from Europe, uh, and people would see a little, a few lights. The Florentines would say, "The lights are on in America. Look, <laughs> we can see lights on America." So there's there's always been this uh, this closeness to America from all of the Azores, but especially from uh, from Flourish. So we'll start with Elaine this time, if you, if you don't mind, Elaine, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go around about a little bit different. So our okay. second poem. Okay, this one is called Pedras Negras. We Picorotos believed the first colonists to suggest that we could protect the vines with lava stones. Our tools were hands planting <laughs> seeds our tools were arms and backs, hauling stones of black basalt. Our tools were tools, metal and wood clanging against hardened lava. Our tools were determination not to die. Our tools were dreams of making home, a belief so firm it grew longer and longer, our coral vineyards now so vast they could stretch around the world twice in a protective embrace. We made this together stone by stone. So vast it is now treasured as world heritage. I wrap my hand around the dark basalt, my fingers embracing its shape until I feel its protection inside me. We Picarotos are called the strong ones. We are the only islanders to make a fortification this extensive. Perhaps we needed it most. Mm -hmm. Oh, lovely. Yes, very, very well. Uh, yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, we can feel Piku, that's for sure. Yes, with that, with that poem. Um, and uh, from uh, we'll go to uh, uh, Logan. Uh, this next poem, uh, I'll tell you since you can't see it, is, is a prose poem or a, a prosema, as I've come to call it in Portuguese. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Onésimo Almeida, who taught me the term. Um, the, the heart of, of the Portuguese, and more specifically to us, the, the Azorean, uh, diasporic experience is often the, the traditions <clears throat> and the rituals that we carry with us in our daily lives here in the U.S. Uh, one of the aspects that, that I enjoy most about living in a community with, with such deeply rooted Azorian culture uh, are the idiosyncrasies and the, the simple pleasures that, that oftentimes may either go unnoticed or underappreciated because of how normalized they've become in our, in our lives. 
So, so one day I, I decided to embark uh, on this mission of, of capturing the obvious. I wanted to, to take the most glaringly Azorian American things that define my cultural experience uh, on the East Coast in, in cities like Fall River, um, where the poem takes place. Uh, and, and I wanted to tap into the gold mine of experience that, that hides in plain sight. Uh, so this poem is one such uh, account of, of something I have a very fond memory of, and uh, one of the most Azorian things that, that one can do in Fall River, which is buying masa suvada, or, or Portuguese sweetbread, uh, as, as we call it in English. Um, so this poem is titled Rituals of, of the Tenth Island. With a clink and a counterclockwise twist of a latch, the double doors swing wide and open their arms to the outside air. Instantly, the fragrance of masa suvada uh, building up for hours collides with the crisp November breeze, twisting and turning its way for blocks, beckoning to passersby, crawling its way up their noses and tugging them in the direction of its origin. A sacred zone only viewed at a glance from the purchasing counter, whose entry is only permitted to a select few who possess the skills bestowed upon them by generations of their predecessors and who will selectively pass them down to those who may determine contain within them the asuryanidad necessary to carry the weight of this cultural responsibility. Outside, a quietness only felt at a specific hour permeates the dormant coastal city. An hour where the crickets have exhausted their calls and the worms still relish in their night covered refuge from even the earliest of early birds. A quietness so deep that if you listen closely enough, you can hear the moon fall into the sea and begin her brief repose. But while she still caresses the city with her placid blanket of luminescence and only a trace of the sun's peach hue peeks up over the horizon and glimpses at his reflection in the still mirror of a river not yet stirred up by even the earliest of early bird fishermen. The day runs full speed ahead and the lines form quickly at Barcelouche Bakery, as Saturday morning is the only acceptable time to avail this delicacy. Any time other than this, although acceptable, is undeniably subpar. <laughs> customer after customer approaches the counter, all with one thing on their mind, the moisture of the masa that exceeds its capacity and seeps slowly through the porous paper bag that cradles it, and the warmth that comes from the brevity of its existence, a warmth that blankets the hands on a brisk New England winter morning and comforts the soul as it is washed down with a fresh espresso. From a shiny metal machine, a firm jet of water hits the freshly emptied shikara, and a cloud of mist momentarily fills the air. My zoom, and the ritual repeats. Mm. Nice. Nice. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, that's uh, that is certainly a prosim in in all aspects, as uh, or Nazim would call it. Um, and uh, Lara, this second poem I'm going to read back to the Azorean Sea, the ocean again of the Azores, uh, is my great grandmother, my Pico great grandmother, uh, Maria. Francesco Cabral, and uh, I had the pleasure of living with her uh, and my grandmother when I was younger for a while, and uh, she, she never went back to the Azores. She was a mail order bride, and she cried a lot because she missed the Azores even into her 90s, uh, and uh, I went back for her but it's not the same, I suppose. It, this is about her. It's called Bound. I found a ship bound for the old country so I could travel back to a past I never lived, to the life of my great grandmother, the woman who started my story. I twisted her ring on my finger and made a wish. At the altar, I kneeled for prayer and host, asked for her asked for the body and blood asked for the resurrection of her body i wanted her whole again so we could find our way back together crocheted into the night my basabo talked to me in my language that she couldn't understand she told me she wanted to go home a ghost ship docked 
It sat silent in the black water and waited for us to board. Her body merged with mine. We returned. The island she remembered was dressed in crags and calderas. She said to me in broken English that when the lava stopped boiling, fish came to the shore and begged to be caught. Her hand filled with sky. Breakers flowered on the beach. Stones showed their frowning faces. She helped me understand the waves, close and far, showed me how to pass through air, pass through water, enter salt. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. José Raposo. Okay. The next poem that I wrote was thinking of what Portugal was centuries ago. Our caravels and our navigators reached places thousands of miles away and not known. I feel that Portugal has an obligation to maintain relations with those countries, <coughs> people that speak our language and even help whenever possible. The dream of Bartolomé de Guzmão and the adventure of Gal Coutinho and Sacadura Cabral are the reality of the plains of today. Therefore, Portugal crossed the air space and unite all the people and the countries that we'd love to speak the language of Camões. I believe that if the space between Earth and the Moon were an ocean, the first spaceship would have been a Portuguese caravel. And here goes the power. It, it, I'd like to say something. Um, it is very hard for me to write a poem that does not rhyme. Because my, my parents had a, a little corner store in the tavern, and there were contigas of the fee almost every night. So, but when someone challenges me to do something, <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I have some poems that they, they rhyme here and there, you know, but this one rhymes in all the quatrains. And the uh, um, it came of a discussion I had one of the Portuguese councils here in San Francisco and thinking about what Portugal was. Portugal, go back to the sea, set sail, ride the waves, and show that you can still be a great land of braves. Go touch every nation where your flag flew before. Give them the inspiration and much, much more. Where your language is spoken, even if you feel the pain, or your promise not to be broken, go back to the sea again. Go sail the seven seas while sailing sing aloud, where there is a Portuguese, Portugal should be proud. Good. Muito bem, sim, senhor. Uh, and uh, our Sam Pereira will end the session. Okay, thank you, Denise. This... Um second poem that I want to read is dedicated to Dinesh. And the reason for that, I suppose, is we both have a, I, I suppose anybody who is Portuguese has a more than a, a just a passing acquaintance with Fernando Pessoa. Yeah. So over the years, I've gotten more and more um, familiar with and been fascinated by Fernando Pessoa. Um, so much so that in recent poems, and this one is, is one of those, I tend to bring him along. He's, uh, he becomes part of my surroundings. He becomes, um, an acquaintance, a friend, and the same is true in this poem. It's called Pessoa Winced. And I'm putting him in situations where he probably would not be, but too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Pessoa's out in the manure looking for mushrooms. I told him the guests would be arriving soon. 
and that they'd be expecting one or two of his stories before the lamb and cabbage got served. Basoa winced, not at the idea of that particular meat and vegetable on a weeknight, but at the apparent reality of guests expecting to be entertained during these troubling times. I'll go, I'll go, Basoa grumbled on his way to the fields. Later, under candlelight, holding a glass of port in his hand, he'd tell them how mushrooms had invaded the country overnight, how everyone became hooked on putting fungi on top of their meats. Even the lamb seemed infested, the cabbage, not so much. They loved when Pessoa told stories. They'd go home half drunk, trying to focus on the road and the stars. Pessoa knew this and smiled. How uncommon it was for his vengeance to have won so easily in the end. <laughs> Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, thank you all. We're going to start our uh, thank you all for for uh, sharing your poems. Um,